Hello, I'm Jason Hooper. And I'm Dan Bell. And today we're going to be discussing some underrated and overrated topics in climbing. By the way, this video is sponsored by Thrive Market. Use the link in our description to get a special discount. The first topic is creatine. Bull testicles. Ah, uh, yes, bull <laughs> testicles. Creatine. I'll take. I'll start Wait, with this one because I did. Jason, you held up this one like this. I like it. No, it's, it's on purpose. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's more it's... underrated but a little, then I'm going to. He's found it like a way this. around the binary answers. Yeah. <laughs> so, here's the reality for me. I mean, creatine seems to be quite helpful for like strength, power, performance stuff, as well as even newer research into cognitive mm -hmm. um, benefits. But taking creatine is not going to all of a sudden add like eight pounds of muscle mass in mm -hmm. two weeks. So that's why I say like overrated slightly because people think the effect size is going to be enormous yeah. when the research just doesn't support that. Yeah, it, it's sort of like the effect size is measurable, which makes it for a supplement enormous. Whoa. It's been basically just established as like the gold standard of supplements for the last like 60 years. But most of the studies over the last 20 years um, have been focusing on its therapeutic effects for other health conditions. And it seems to be remarkably promising, which is not surprising given that it's one of the main energetic moderators of like the entire <laughs> human biology. So um, it may have a lot of side benefits um, and it's somewhat interesting if nothing else. Uh, can you touch on, just because this is the thing that people tend to be most concerned about, the potential weight gain aspect of it? You don't put on that much weight. You sort of can't. Um, big power lifters, because it, it, it tends to scale with lean muscle mass, right? And so, one, climbers just tend to be relatively small, at least relative to, like, large athletes in other sports. So most climbers will not put on more than maybe a couple of pounds. The other thing is... An example that I kind of like and I think is quite relevant is like, if you put on some weight with creatine, that is pretty good evidence that you needed it, right? It's like, my car in fact weighs more when it has a full tank of gas. I'd say in a nutshell, just don't worry about it. Yeah. And if you are worried about it, just stop. look up. <laughs> <laughs> just stop. One of the things that people miss out on is like, people will frequently cycle creatine. By far the biggest and most significant results that have been measured are in longer studies. Basically, the longer you take it, the bigger the effect size is because it simply lets you train a little bit harder every session forever. So under the premise that you're probably gonna take this stuff forever, um, there's no reason, there's no need to load. And that can cause some, well, I don't know why it would, but it does sometimes get reported as causing mild gastric distress yeah. if you take a bunch. So five grams will definitely get you there probably over the course of a month. Um, and for most people, maintenance is in the neighborhood of like two grams. So yeah, grab a teaspoon if it's flat or rounded, whatever. Agreed. Yeah. All right. The next one is sure to get some people riled up and that mm. is diet tracking. Ooh. Diet tracking. Yeah. Disclaimer, right? Like if you have concerns over like the mental aspect of diet tracking, um, talk to a healthcare professional beforehand. Although there are studies that say if you have no history of disordered eating or eating disorders, um, then there doesn't seem to be an inherent risk associated with diet tracking, but just make an individual decision. Yeah. Um, with that being said, I mean, I can't raise this higher. There are studies that show that registered dietitians and normal people, when asked to guesstimate their calorie tracking for the day, are regularly, regular people are about 50% off, and registered dietitians, who should be the best at this, are 20% off. So we are bad at knowing how much we are actually eating. So it's, if you wanna actually know like your macros or just your calories, it's kind of impossible if you don't have any tracking yeah. background. Stop acting like you know the way ahead, like you know the rules. There are no rules, man. We're lost. No, no, no. For general health purposes, it is critical that you have an acceptably healthy diet. And for athletic performance, it's really important. And for a body weight sport, it's insanely important. <laughs> so yeah. like, you know, anything you do can be taken to disadvantageous extremes. You know, like climbing is pretty safe. You can do it in the gym, you can do it on a rope, you can go free solo, you can go do like alpine shit in the mountains and now it's very dangerous. Uh, you can get crazy with your diet. I would recommend not doing that. But um, the only way that you're gonna be able to make 
dexterous and progressively good decisions with it is by having something to look back on and experiment with. And if you don't, I mean, yeah, you're just never going to get a, a good subtle sense of like what your body wants and needs if you don't track it to some extent. It's just not going to happen. And, and I would add like to Dan saying, don't go extreme with it. There's also the reality that label makers in at least the United States, they don't have to be perfectly accurate. I forget yeah. if it's 10 or 15 or 20% um, for error, but like your 200 calorie bar could be 220, it could be yeah. 180. Yeah. So like don't obsess, but the, the tracking can be a very helpful guideline. Yeah, yeah. I'm a boredom eater, so my intuition for hunger is terrible. If I'm yeah. bored, I'm snacking. Yeah, and to some extent, ironically, like exercise suppresses hunger for the most part. I mean, there's variation in individuals. So in a lot of cases with climbing, it's like when they diet to lose weight, which is a very reasonable thing to do from time to time for climbing, they don't have a sense of where they're at. And so frequently you end up with two extreme diets, which lead to bad psychological situations as well as reduced performance. So mm. knowing where your baseline is allows you to make a reasonable guess as far as increasing macros or caloric intake for training, as well as reducing it in a mild, responsible way to happily and healthily get to like performance weights. If you're trying to lose weight and you're not tracking and you're not actually in a calorie defi deficit, that's gonna be frustrating. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to get stronger and you're not eating enough calories, that's gonna be frustrating. So there are yeah. other mental aspects that are solved by yeah. diet tracking. I have definitely seen people's relationship with food and diet improve with diet tracking for sure. Like I'm one 100%, of them. Yeah. you know, a lot. Um, just anecdotally, uh, if you wanna start diet tracking, I've seen a lot of success with starting to track without any explicit goal as far as weight change. Um, I think that, that makes it a lot more psychologically benign um, and it keeps you from sort of altering the experiment as well. Um, the goal is to just kind of see like what your normal habits are so then you can make changes in the future as opposed to kind of trying to measure something while you're actively messing with it. Do you want to make any recommendation as to what to diet tracking, tracking app? Oh, I really like Macro Factor and love basically everything Stronger by Science does. Um, we are not affiliated with them at all, sadly. It's because I didn't answer our email. Because I didn't answer our email. <laughs> well, don't you love me? The next topic is BCAAs, or branched chain oh. amino acids. They're overrated in the sense that there are cheaper, better alternatives. I think basically people have successfully made them taste good recently and they have an extremely high profit margin, but they were essentially shot down like almost 10 years ago at this point. It's like kind of a settled argument. They contain and are frequently dominated by leucine, which does directly stimulate the mTOR pathway, which does cause muscular protein synthesis, but so do basically all high quality proteins. Um, so if you find that leucine appears to be helpful for you, um, I would consider just trying a high quality protein supplement as it will likely have better outcomes. Most of the products that are selling this stuff, especially within climbing, but kind of like to the market at large, all blew up after it was found that this is like basically bullshit, which is ridiculous. You're like, yeah. this is some predatory nonsense. <laughs> We're all gonna die. It's not today. The next topic is collagen supplements. <laughs> <laughs> serious face. Oh wait, serious face. So there's a thing called the protein quality score. <laughs> I mean, honestly, we have like a full like video about all the research on it and why like the research for collagen is just not great. The philosophy is that the specific amino acid profile of collagen is going to be more relatable for your actual connective tissue as mm -hmm. a climber. So it's going to be more directly applicable to climbers to ingest. There's just no evidence to suggest that that is the case or that that matters because your body is going to use the aminos where it needs to. But here's the big thing. If you're using collagen as a supplement, especially like after like training, um, if you do not get the required amount of leucine, your body has no reason to activate muscle synthesis and collagen will never get there. I think you need mm -hmm. to take 80 grams or more of collagen to get the required leucine. Yeah. Whereas that's like, it's like 25 for whey protein. Y yeah, depending so, on the formulation. Because you need something yeah. like two grams of leucine to kick this stuff off, maybe a little less. Um, yeah. World's tiniest pushback on that is of all of the zany things that climbers do to try to get an edge, collagen's fairly inexpensive. It's almost certainly harmless. It's low calories. Like you could certainly give it a try if you want, 
maybe for some reason that's hard to imagine it's beneficial. But if you did, I would go with a generic brand because the ones that are marketed to climbers are overpriced, taste bad, and almost certainly don't work any better. <laughs> How neat is that? That's pretty neat. Next one is prioritizing animal proteins over plant proteins. Dude. Oh, Wait, shit. oh. <laughs> I was going to say, Colors. my perspective on that just shifted with new research that hmm. is that was basically comparing the two and said that there wasn't a huge um, effect size difference with plant versus animal. The reality for me, if I just want to boil this down simply, is are you getting leucine? Because yeah. if your goal is to build muscle, then you need protein, you need a certain amount of it, and you need leucine. Animal proteins get you there maybe, maybe slightly quicker yeah. or faster than plant, but you can still certainly get there. So I think just having to be like animal protein based is overrated. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's very possible to have like completely equivalent success with either approach. Um, Animal protein in some ways is more foolproof because all of it is a complete protein. Basically all of it is high quality protein. Um, you know, it, it's pretty mindless if you're doing like uh, animal or dairy. Um, if you are eating vegetable or plant protein, you probably need somewhat more. Um, it's not generally as bioavailable. Um, if you're getting it from sort of like the raw food as opposed to uh, intentionally kind of like refined uh, plant protein powders, you may need to be a little careful to get the, an adequate sort of like spread of amino acids. A lot of the like protein bars you'll see at gyms and things that are plant-based end up with like 12 to 20 grams of plant protein. And my guess would be that it's probably not as well balanced. So if you're just kind of jamming like a generic vegan protein bar, you might want to be a little careful that you're getting an adequate dose. But yeah, with, with a little bit of care, you should be able to accomplish whatever you need through a plant-based diet. All right, the next topic is saving money on groceries. Ooh. Easy. Way underrated. <laughs> Lucky for us, today's video is sponsored by Thrive Market. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store with guaranteed savings on every order. Do you hate wondering if you're getting the best prices on groceries? Do you sigh every time you realize you have to make another trip to the grocery store when all you want to do is go climbing? Thrive Market might just be the solution for you because Thrive members save on every order and if you find a lower price somewhere else, they'll match it. Even on this relatively small order, we saved almost $30. I use Thrive's slick interface and filtering features to make it easy to shop by whatever category I wanted. It's so nice to be able to get a variety of products from peanut butter to peach rings to pasta sauce without having to wander endless aisles wondering where the one thing I want is. Plus, Thrive is constantly adding new products that also happen to have customer reviews, something you can't get at a grocery store. The best part is, orders over $49 ship free. No tipping or additional fees. Isn't that right, Reg? Yeah! <laughs> Visit thrivemarket.com forward slash Hooper's Beta to get 30% off your first Thrive Market order and a free gift worth up to $60. Thanks to Thrive Market for sponsoring this video. All right, moving on to the next category, which is recovery. First topic oh. is deloads or deload weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to kick it off? No, you go for it. Okay. I don't think deloads are a bad idea, and I think many climbers don't take any time off ever, barring injury or, yeah, basically barring injury. <laughs> ever. <laughs> so in that context, it's probably underrated, and people should do more of it, probably. But I think it's another one of those things where as aspects of sports science from other disciplines trickle into climbing, people get a little too rigid about it. Um, I think a lot of the pacing of it is because you got to choose something and it's a little bit convenient for coaches to just say every fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever week is a light week. It's certainly easy to tell people to do it, but it's often not needed on that kind of interval. However, people basically never have a perfectly balanced training routine. Therefore, it is good to have periods where you allow excess uh, fatigue to dissipate. I think you put up the wrong sign, Dan. You made a great argument for underrated. I put up underrated more. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah okay. I think, I think oh, okay. not enough people do it, but I think oh. the way that people talk about it is a little too hype trained. I only saw the yeah. red one. The overrated component to me is that people don't really take it with that much of a scientific approach. Yeah. They just say this might be good. Mm -hmm. um, 
The underrated for me is vastly related to injuries because I see injuries. That's like what I yeah. <laughs> see day in, day yeah. out. And oftentimes it's because people um, just have this nonstop training regimen and they're pushing as hard as they can. And there is like the, the fitness fatigue model to keep in mind. Whereas if you are training at super high intensities, you can accumulate um, fatigue, which will decrease your performance. And if your performance decreases, then you're not actually making improvements. Whereas like a deload phase can reduce the fatigue and allow you to perform well again. But my bias towards underrated is mostly in injury prevention. Cause like Dan said, it, in a perfect world, you'd balance it out, but that's not what I see. Not down climbing to avoid ex <laughs> not down climbing to avoid eccentric fatigue. Wait, so to avoid, so avoiding so you're you're, down climbing to avoid eccentric so, fatigue. So you're you're trying you're not yeah. down climbing to prevent fatigue, basically. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna put that past overrated to the point of like absurdity. You could look at it as like a black and white, like the more contact you have on a hold, the more energy you're using. Sure. So I want to hear your argument. I guess it depends on what you mean by down climbing to start with. Like most yeah. people don't completely down climb the climbs that they're climbing. Even if you did, I think that there would be a significant, probably useful stress associated with that. It definitely helps with sort of like uh, learning and integrating movement patterns. And being a competent down climber is a very useful skill, both for performance and for survivability outdoors. But I think mostly when people down climb, it's like reversing a few moves. You're going down some down climbing jugs so that you take less of a like <laughs> raucous fall to the ground, which I think immensely outweighs the, the relative. Additionally, as far as eccentrics go, your hands aren't doing a like particularly meaningful eccentric down climbing versus up climbing. Your elbows and shoulders are. But for most people, that's going to be assisted reverse pull-ups, which is going to be so light from an eccentric component that like it, it should be negligible. <laughs> that said, like if your goal is to do like short hard boulders and you're reversing everything, you're not doing what you planned on. So like within reason, I think it's probably a good thing to do. And if you're doing something like totally nonsensical, that's probably not a great thing to do. For the fatigue component of it, like saying you have to jump off at the top on every single one, I don't think the, the benefits of that outweigh the, the benefits you're losing, like the practice down climbing, the eccentric control, the body awareness that you mentioned. So I definitely think it's overrated in that like it's not gonna be as damning as you mm -hmm. people are portraying it to be. And it's also a safety thing to be able to down climb some yeah. before you jump. There's a reason to down climb. There's a reason sometimes to jump off. Like stop saying you have to do it one way or the other, yeah. please. Yeah. yeah. In entirety. Yeah. Basically like statements and absolutes are fun, but they're not normally right. Yeah. And I think we know that. <laughs> You should always like and subscribe and share <laughs> with your friends. Yeah, you should always like and subscribe. Always. <laughs> the next topic is ice baths and cold showers. Yeah. Yeah. Overrated. Overrated. For sure. Cold showers, it, it should be like recognized, are going to have significantly different effects from mm. ice baths. I mean, they're just not nearly cold enough to do a lot of the things that are purported from ice baths. Yeah. Unless Neither of them are likely job. to affect your, your climbing very directly. Yeah. But they may do some other interesting things. Yeah. Like I would I would honestly never really stop anyone that said they wanted to do a cold shower. Yeah. Whereas if someone said I'd they were like crazy, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but like if someone was actually doing hypertrophy training and they mm -hmm. were doing ice baths, I would recommend they stop. Yeah. All right, moving on to the next category, which is climbing. The first topic is high angle crimping. Mm. Um, uh, high, yeah, well, you mean full crimping? <laughs> we spoke quite a lot about high angle crimping. Essentially what that really allows you to do is utilize any like in-cut on any holes that you use. And it allows you to generate force away from the wall. I think it's overrated only in the sense that somehow it's recently re-emerged as some magical thing. So somehow we've had for a while, people are like freakishly concerned about injury risk with crimps. And now you have Aiden Roberts use a term that's not super common in the States. And now it's how you climb V17, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but crimps are good. It's important to have some sort of active grip and you need to be able to dig behind in cut holds. So I like crimps. I don't think there's anything magical about them. Oh, magic. 
if you're a newer or more intermediate mm. climber, just use caution because the more flexion you get at your PIP joint, the more axial load and compression you're going to get and the more likely you are to develop some like PIP joint synovitis. Yeah. And if you're hypermobile, like, I mean, I guess if you're coming really high over, you may not get hyperextension, mm -hmm. but you may yeah. also develop pain at that DIP or distal joint. That's actually a great point. No surprise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if this is a fad of some variety, or at least something that's much more popular recently, you run the risk of having significant background strengths by climbing however it is you normally climb and then now having the capacity to really injure yourself because you're applying that strength to a position that you're like pretty inexperienced with. Mm. Remember, with great power. Right. Here's one that might be a little bit tricky. This one is stopping your session early to avoid fatigue or the idea that less is always more. Generally, I feel like underrated. Most people kind of just rage until they can't anymore. And I think that there is merit to ending things intentionally when either you've accomplished the goals that you've set for yourself or performance dips depending. But I guess also there's been a lot of noise recently about like never going to failure or like somehow fatiguing sessions being like major culprits for injury and that's probably somewhat overblown. I see a lot of injuries from people doing these extremely long sessions mm -hmm. like trying to get every ounce of it they can out of their fingers and our fingers just aren't honestly good at giving us feedback on when they're actually fatigued and hitting like a failure point yeah um and so injuries can occur so i think it's it's definitely of value to have a stopping point and i think what dan said is great like set like a a goal or set like mini goals and mm -hmm. if you can accomplish at least one of them then great you don't have to just go to absolute failure every time. 100%. Do you know who I am? No, I, I can't say that I do. Some amount is necessary to trigger an adaptive response. And beyond that, you start getting diminishing returns. And depending on your situation, you need more or less of those for things to proceed nicely. But the second thing is I think where people really make the mistake with excessively long sessions is not moderating their sessions with fatigue. Because you're gonna have a very different experience if you basically are like, so psyched, run into the gym, flail on the hardest things that you possibly can, and the session finishes with just some absolute travesty <laughs> of an attempt on like things that are still near limit, versus if you were to finish out the session with a little bit more like easier technique-based boulders or some intentional ergonomic like endurance training, both of which are much less likely to cause injuries while allowing you to work in these like sort of fatigue failure states effectively. So, you know, don't do super intense stuff when you can't maintain acceptable form. Here's an interesting one. Hmm. Warming up before climbing. What? what? Do uh, what? Uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, both. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people don't warm up at all and very much should. Yes. But then some people are convinced that they need to like go for a jog or like have to do like 30 minutes of like jump rope or bicycling or something like that, which is not, I think, particularly necessary. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Perfectly said, but I also think people fall into this, like there has to be some like absolute specific warm up routine, mm -hmm. but not only can that vary individual to individual, it could also vary day to day, depending yeah. on your climbing goals or intentions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely like sometimes not utilized at all. So underrated, but also <laughs> Sometimes people hyper focus on it so much. Yeah, it if you got two hours to climb, spending like an hour warming up is like just a terrible use of time. Yeah. <laughs> I guess as a tip, every element of a warm up should have a specific purpose. Um, and generally, what I look for is a couple of things in a moderate rep range to sort of help literally warm up the muscles. I haven't found that that's as necessary in climbing as with some like field sports and things. You don't need to like, you know, again, like jog, run, whatever but doing some stuff that's like slightly, slightly fatiguing combined with some things that are a little bit harder or a little bit more uh, like movement pattern based that do a acceptable job of simulating the type of harder things that you're gonna do in a session. 
So the more a day is kind of like volume or technique oriented, probably the less explicit warm up you need to do is you can ease into it sensibly. If you're going into like kind of rage on some projects, it's probably good to do a couple of easier things that are in a somewhat similar style to kind of get things firing and coordinated. Um, may or may not help with injury prevention depending on the person and circumstance, but will likely help you get better quality out of each of your attempts. Board climbing, specifically moonboarding. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know on this one. Yeah. Like. I think these days moonboarding is overrated. I think they're a great resource under a lot of circumstances, but I think that they are too stylistically limited to maybe have quite the favor that they currently see. Probably a lot of people will benefit from at least stints on the moon board, but as like their main training focus, if you have access to other forms of difficult climbing, probably disadvantageous. Um, specifically, there aren't really any bad feet, there aren't really any bad hands, and it lacks much of like a tension component once you're used to the style. So it tends to be pretty snatchy on relatively good holds out of relatively weird positions. There's a lot of merit to that, but I think people uh, put it on too much of a pedestal. So to follow up on that, the next subject is board climbing in general. Yeah. I think a well-set spray wall is potentially the best training tool that you can have full stop. Um, they are hard to set perfectly and frequently take more uh, sort of rounds of iteration than many gyms want to deal with. But with a good one, it's like you should be able to train more or less any style of move, more or less any difficulty. Um, they're a really, really good way to build fitness and learn technique. If any of you viewers have any suggestions for topic areas for us to consider, we'll have to uh, circle back with part two. Until then, train, climb, send, and... Subscribe. Oh yeah, yeah, that too. And repeat. <laughs> Don't forget to use the link in our description to get 30% off your first Thrive Market order.